loves philosophy. So the first thing about this poem is that it's set up around a central conceit. And a conceit is an extended metaphor which is a single comparison but it's explored in different ways throughout the poem. So this kind of central comparison, this central image is used to sort of shed light on a topic in different ways all the way through the poem. It's a romantic poem. Shelley was one of the romantics. Romantic poetry um, had, well, it was very much concerned with human emotions, which this one is. It has a, a strong and usually very simple rhyme scheme, usually rhythm scheme as well. Um, and romantics are very concerned with nature as well. There's lots of natural imagery in the poem. And that often runs through as a theme as well, which it certainly does here. Finally, the language itself is generally very simple. The Romantic Poets talked about the language of men, like the everyday person being able to access poetry. So all of these things are true of this poem. So it's a quite a typical example of a Romantic Poem. Perhaps except the rhythm scheme, which we'll come on to a little bit earlier, a little bit later on. Right, so the title of this poem, Love's Philosophy, seems that it's going to be about sort of theories about the nature of love. What is love? How does it behave? What are the rules that it lives by? Um, it could be philosophy, a set of theories that are, are sort of owned by love, that have been thought of by love, almost like love's being personified. Um, but equally, it might be... Uh, pertaining to love, about the idea of love. So this idea about what love is, um, is linked in with this central conceit. And we can see what this central conceit is straight away. Um, let's have a look at the whole of the first stanza, first of all, and the, the ideas in it. The fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. The wind of heaven mixed together with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single, all things by a law divine in another being's mingle, why not I with thine? So, um, the fountains and the river mingling together, the winds mixing, to, mixing together, nothing in the whole world is single. And that's according to divine law, the law of God. Everything has to mingle together. So therefore, why aren't I mingling together with you? Um, so this sets up from the very first couple of lines with the fountains mingling with the river, this, this central conceit. Um, everything in nature mixes and mingles. Um, so therefore, so should we. That's his argument. Um, looking at the first line, the fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever. I'm quite interested in the verbs in these first couple of lines. So mingle and mix. They're alliterative verbs. Their um, synonyms mix and mingle. And they're very gentle verbs. And this seems to uh, reinforce the idea of everything mixing together, the central idea of kind of mingling. Almost like the, the verbs themselves mingle 
intermingle because they match in terms of sound and meaning. Um, and then as you read through the first few, few lines, which are about, of course, um, the water, um, so the fountains, the rivers, the ocean, um, and and the idea of winds as well, um, sort of blowing through the through the uh, the trees and, and mixing together. So I'm listening to the sounds here: the F, the V, the V, and then also you've got the S sounds: ocean, sweet winds. Recursive sounds, that's the F's and the V's. And the sibilant sounds, that's the S's. When you put them together and read the whole of those first four lines, it maybe echoes the sound. Of the water. And the wind rustling. So when you put them together, they've got an onomatopoeic quality. Again, sort of reinforcing this idea of, of uh, togetherness. Let's just reinforce that for you for your notes, which bit's which. Okay. Um, with a sweet emotion, of course, there's this some warmth and some romance in that image. And then the next one, nothing in the world is single, all things by a law divine. So here we're seeing that um, a law divine, that divine law is God's law. So it's God's word, God's law that na everything in nature mingles. That's quite interesting, isn't it? So, in other words, if you don't do that, you're going against God's law. Um, when you get to the end of the line, then the end of the verse, then and you look at why not I with thine? This rhetorical question. It, it's almost saying, you know that. We're doing something wrong by not being together. And also, um, there's something quite wistful about that rhetorical question, isn't there? Like, he longs for the company of a girl. A woman. Also, when you look at that language in that rhetorical question at the end there, why not I with thine... Now, thine is like a form of thou. It's a form of you, isn't it, that we don't really use anymore. Um, so even then it was archaic or old fashioned when the poem was written in 1819. Which sort of creates this sense that his predicament is a universal, eternal predicament. It's been going on for centuries. It will continue to go on. Um, and this is something that many people may have felt before. Moving on then to the next section. See the mountains kiss high heaven and the waves clasp one another. Actually here, the verbs are a little bit more forceful, aren't they, than the mix and mingle. Um, the guttural alliteration, the two C sounds, which is quite harsh. Um, we've got a repetition of these verbs further down. All these things together 
really suggests that he's someone who is losing control here. He's becoming increasingly frustrated by her refusal of him. Um, and we even had a little bit like um, at the end of Farmer's Bride, we've got similar um, I, similar devices being used to show this kind of loss of control. We've got the alliteration of the H again. Almost like heavy breathing we talked about before, panting um, in this voice, um, connected very much with the forceful repetition of this gut, these guttural, guttural alliterative uh, verbs. Um, again, he seems to be someone losing control. And then you look at the next two lines. No sister flower could be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And on the one hand, you think, oh, that, that's a lovely image of two flowers next to each other. Of course, they would never turn away from each other. Of course, they would turn to each other um, and it would be it would be wrong not to. But look, they couldn't be forgiven if a sister turned away from his her brother. It could not be forgiven. And, and this reminds us of earlier, the um, divine law. So obviously what this is saying is that it's actually it, it, it what this is suggesting is that it's wrong for a female to deny a male. A female flower to uh, reject or deny if it disdained its brother. So looking on the surface like a very innocent, sweet, um, image, but actually there's a little harsh undertone there, a little threat that it's almost a sin not to um, to do what you are told to do by nature. Uh, and actually using sister and brother as well, possibly a little bit religious when we talk about the, the word sister and brother. Sister and brother suggests a really kind of fraternal um, relationship, religious, fraternal, that means brother and sister, like a sibling relationship, which is very innocent. Actually, interestingly, he's talking about um, having a physical relationship, presumably outside of marriage. This seems to be someone that he is not married to um, and doesn't have a long term relationship with that he wants to kiss him and maybe something more. So there's something a little bit um, perhaps even sinister about that to those two lines, I think. Um, moving on, the sunlight clasps the earth, repetition of clasp again, quite desperate, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. Think about the sunlight and the moonbeams. There's lots and lots of layers of meaning in here. Obviously, light is the bringer of energy. It's a life force. We couldn't have life on Earth without the light of the sun. And Shelley being very interested in, in science would be well aware of that. Light is romantic. Um, but here he's talking about the way that, that light brings energy in life as being a very physical expression, clasping and kissing. Almost suggesting in a way that, that, um, that physical relationships, even sex, are part of creation. And of course, they're certainly sort of part of procreation. We couldn't have life without um, without sex, could we? Um, but equally, here he's suggesting that you know that that to not have that kind of physical relationship is going against nature. When he gets to the end, it's almost like he's saying everything in nature is worthless if um, if she doesn't kiss him. What are all these kissings worth? 
if thou not kiss me? Another rhetorical question. Um, suggesting really that he, kissing him is the most important thing, even more important than the rest of creation put together. Again, using thou, which we talked about before being archaic. And that's how he ends the poem. Come on, you know, everything in nature tells you you should be giving in to me. So come on, give in to me. OK, let's have a quick look at the metre throughout the poem. Um, now, on the whole, the um, metre in this poem is trochaic. And that means um, it sort of starts with the unlike iambic, which is de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum Trochaic is dum de dum de dum de dum de, and it ends on a on a unstressed syllable. Um, which and it seems very simple in many ways. Um, the first two lines don't quite scan actually, which is interesting. The fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. It's simple and gentle. The idea that it's simple and gentle, these things can come together to um, suggest maybe simplicity, the inevitability of them getting together. It's got to happen, it's going to happen sometime, a little bit like the predictability of, of the rhyme scheme, except that it's not quite irregular. It's not quite regular. And you might say that in some ways that undermines his argument. Let's have a look at what I mean. The fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Not, it does not quite scanning. It, it nearly works as trochaic metre, but it's not quite regular. Now, could this undermine his tone a little bit? Could he, on the one hand, be trying to argue that everything is simple and inevitable and he is absolutely right in what he's asking her to do, whilst at the same time perhaps undermining himself by the irregularity? Um, perhaps he doesn't really believe it. Perhaps he's just saying it. Um, let's have a look at the rhyme now. We've looked at the metre. Now, this is really clever because what Shelley does is he mixes together feminine rhyme and masculine rhyme in the same poem in quite an interesting way. So if we look here at divine and thine, those are clear, masculine, strong rhymes because these are stressed syllables divine with thine um and that's kind of really strong rhyme all the things all things all things by a law divine in another beings mingle why not i with thine but at the same time you've also got single and mingle which is feminine rhyme Because this last syllable is um, is unstressed. It's even more obvious here with river and forever, where uh, this the stress syllable doesn't rhyme. Riv, ev, doesn't rhyme. It's only the ver bit that rhymes. So that's a much weaker form of rhyme when the when the syllable's unstressed. How interesting that he's kind of mixing and mingling the genders through his rhyme scheme. And so in many ways, his, his whole argument about um, mixing and mingling being a natural thing is is 
portrayed to us through the form and also through the imagery. Let's start having a look at the imagery now across the whole poem. So all the way through, we've got the eternal flow of natural elements. We've talked about the water. We've talked about the wind. We've talked about the mountains. We've talked about the sea. Uh, we've talked about sunlight, moonlight, um, plants. It's all, almost like all of nature is in an eternal flow, especially this section here, fountains into river, into ocean. And then the idea of heaven and earth mixing together. All of nature, eternal flow, mixing together. And then we've got this um, religious imagery also in the poem, which we talked about before. So we've talked about earth. Uh, nature imagery and also religious imagery and there's lots of that there's uh the winds of heaven here there is um heaven again here there is um the the idea of the sister and the brother has religious connotations all of this suggests that physical love is wholesome and natural and again even though he's talking about a physical relationship outside of marriage you might think he's just being very very cynical and he just wants this woman to kiss him and whatever else he wants her to do um however you could also look at this line and this idea in a slightly different way because because we're not quite in many ways convinced by his argument um, because the the form perhaps doesn't quite work in a regular way. It's not quite strong. Um, some of his imagery is so over the top, so hyperbolic um, that perhaps it, do, it isn't as persuasive as it could be. Um, obviously, quite possibly, he's mocking the idea of the romantic who um, really wants to have a relationship with um, with a woman, a physical relationship with a woman. And yet his idea that this is natural and inevitable isn't going to work and she's not going to give in to him. Um, and therefore, actually, what, what Shelley's doing is making fun, perhaps of himself when he's tried to have this conversation before with a woman, um, perhaps when he was younger, who knows? Um, or perhaps he's mocking just the whole idea of um of, of of males through history um wanting this particular thing from a woman but we must sort of note down really how clever it is that the form and the imagery all of the writer's methods here seem to contribute work together really to contribute to the overall argument Togetherness being natural and innocent. But our sort of final word on that really are we convinced? We know that, that Shelley was an atheist, he's invoking religion a few times here in the poem is he hard and um cynical in his invocation of religion for his own physical pleasure or um is he is is this poem much more playful is he um playing with the idea of men um trying desperately to have the attention of women but really just not succeeding I'll leave that to you to decide.